stock market is at an all-time high, crypto is at an all-time high, and going to start off the earnings season, corporate earnings are at an all-time high. That is until Snapchat reported their earnings here recently. But ladies and gentlemen, also most importantly, real estate is at an all-time high. Everybody that knows and who owns the home or who's trying to get into the real estate market know that it's pretty hard for a buyer to be able to get a good price these days these days and the sellers pretty much getting any price that they want. So with all this going on, even though we have stocks at an all time high, real estate and cryptocurrency and corporate earnings at an all time high, we also have high inflation. The recent CPI report, Consumer Price Index report, reported a 5.4% inflation rate. With that being said, we know what time it is when it comes down to the Federal Reserve, Jerome Powell. Jerome Powell and Federal Reserve, we're looking at them possibly raising interest rates, leaving a lot of people in uncertainty. What does it mean for real estate? But out there across the globe, people say, hey, where there's uncertainty, there's opportunity. That's what we're here to discuss today. Areas of opportunity in real estate with none other than my guest, Mr. Sean Sutton. He's a loan officer out in Honolulu, Hawaii. And ladies and gentlemen, he's going to be here live here in a second. But if you haven't done so already, go ahead and make sure you hit that like, subscribe, comment, and share button, and all those great things like that. But without further ado, let me introduce my guest. Sean, how is it going today, sir? I need a fake round of applause, don't you? <laughs> oh, it's always great to get admiration, all right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Definitely. It's uh, going very good, very good. I can't complain. Living out in Hawaii, enjoying this aloha and sunshine. Okay, great. Now, uh, let me just get straight into it because I know I don't have a lot of time. And I definitely know the guys and girls that are tuning in, catching their live, or the playback, video, or audio. Right now, where do you feel we're at right now in real estate? Because some people are saying, hey, we're in an overinflated market. We're waiting for that bear that's peeking his head around the corner. Where do you think we're at in real estate? You think we're in an expansion? We're in a peak? Or you think that um, we're actually on a downturn? What do you think? I think right now, uh, there's always a lot of talk about the inflation and whether or not that is going to hit. Um, really, it's area dependent. Um, coming into areas such as like Hawaii, you're definitely going to see where we're getting a point of saturation in terms of buyers. There's plenty of them. But as they hit this market, you start to soon realize that it's really, you're kind of outpacing the majority of buyers that are out there on the market. Um, it's leaving a, a small area of opportunity for uh, a few, in a sense. So with that being said, and then with interest rates on the rise, um, you're going to see that, that demand to go out and purchase drop, in my estimation. Okay. So if you're somewhere and you're on the buyer side of the house, um, what would you do? Would you wait it out? Would you just jump right in? Or what will be your thought process with that? My thought process for that would be if you're a buyer and you're looking to purchase a home right now, if you have the means to do so, go ahead and do that. Uh, right now, with inventories being where they are, um, trying to wait it out, it's a, steady, um, it's a steady pace. It's not to say that pricing at some point or interest rate at some level is just going to make it more advantageous to, hey, all these homes are going to open up and be able to go out and buy on the market. I think if you can get in now, go ahead and get in there so that way you're able to achieve the objective, so to say. You have your property in hand, if you're looking to invest, or you're just looking for your home at this moment. Um, it's just right now, the steady state is such a, a slow downturn to where I think you should go ahead and make that purchase if you have the ability to do so. Now, going to the real estate market, we know there are different types of ways you can get into real estate. You got land, you got actual real estate. Then you have these things called REIT, Real Estate Investment Trust. If you were to go into the market, just those general areas that you would go into, which one would you go into? Land, real estate, or real estate investment trust, and why? I would go into real estate. Mm -hmm. That's the way I do things, um, especially kind of being out this way. Um, that's probably one of the more popular aspects of it is going through, and people love to buy properties here because there's so many different, so much versatility, I should say. In terms of whether or not you want to be a renter, or if you're doing Airbnbs in some particular parts of the island. And the same thing may hold true depending on where you stay there on the mainland. Um, again, if you're in an area, a large area here, we don't have a lot of land. So if you can manage to go ahead and, you know, you have that money to pony up to go and do that, that's always advantageous. Now, if you're someplace that's big, got a lot of land there, such as Texas, 
things of that nature, then yes, um, if you can get your hands on it, then go ahead and do so. Okay. Now, let me ask this question here. Going into, um, I think, the first quarter, maybe second quarter of next year, the Federal Reserve, you know, they have their fingers on the interest rate button. The interest rates are, you know, extremely low. They lowered the interest rates at the, at the beginning of uh, last year because of the pandemic. Now, with, with a very low interest rate society, in general, in general, generally speaking, now with we just seen the weekly jobs report come out today. Jobs uh, unemployment is starting to drop. We see housing market is doing well. Stock market is doing well. The, the economy is, look like it's on an upswing. It may not feel like it, but um, looking at the numbers, it is. But we also have some inflation running at 5.4%. Do you think the Federal Reserve will raise interest rates in Q1 or Q2 next year? And what effect would that have on real estate? I think they're probably going to wind up raising those interest rates. We are, we're having what I would call like a downward trend right now where the costs associated with the rates, we're all we're accustomed to seeing these historically these historically low interest rates. I know that sometimes is an overused term, but um, I could definitely see that trending in that direction. I mean, they have to do something to, I guess, to offset uh, what's all this transpired over the last year and a half. So with that being said, that kind of feeds into this idea of this inflation. And I think going forward, if you look ahead even further, um, you're going to see where interest rates go up, and then you're going to see a reverberation of the same will drop back down, perhaps maybe like in 2023. Okay. Now let's look for someone who already owns a house like yourself, who's out there in Hawaii, who's built up all this equity. You know, for people to understand what equity is, you purchase a home for one price and the value of the home goes up on um, the market right now. So you have that little cushion of what you owe on the house versus what the house is worth. Some people have so much equity right now. Some people have, you know, a hundred thousand, 200,000, a million dollars, half a million, whatever. What can I do with that equity? Should I leave my equity there? What are some options I can do with this equity that's built up into my house? Uh, that's a good question. I get asked that a lot. When it comes down to the equity within your home, especially right now, um, again, rising costs, um, just you see things all over the place. Um, in terms of just the equity alone, you can use that if you want to go into um, investing properties, if you're looking to expand your portfolio in a sense, if you want to add in real estate and pick up like a small condo, an apartment, or another home like that to rent out, that's one way of looking at it. If you want to increase that equitable margin within your own property. Renovations are a very, very popular item at this moment. But as I was stating when I first started, the cost of lumber, things associated with renovating your home makes that a little bit of a slippery slope because it's costing so much and you're draining all of your equity out of it to try to get that done. Um, so just have to be careful in that aspect. But again, to answer that more directly, um, when it comes down to renovating the home, investing in future properties or other properties, um, those are the main two tickets that I see so far. Let me ask you this question. So you brought up a very good point about the rising cost of materials, which is connected to inflation. You know, inflation, price of services, goods and services goes up. So it only makes sense that lumber and bricks and concrete, I don't know the whole recipe to build a house, but those things seems like that's what happens to, you know, the price of it goes up. So you say, hey, if I go out and renovate the material, I could be buying at a premium, meaning a higher price versus what if I just took a, a HELOC or took out a HELOC loan and maybe that's the only way I can look at you getting your equity out of your house. And when it purchased land, because land, just vacant land right now is benefiting from inflation. What do you think about that concept? That's one way to take, a, to take a look at that. You mentioned before about pulling equity out of your home. You can do it through your HELOC or you can do it through a cash out refinance as well. So that way you're able to really- That's a good question, but I want to ask you that question. I mean, you cut you off there. What are some ways that I can use or take out the cash or take out the money and equity in my house? What can I do with it? So with that, what can you do with it? Um, again, once that money comes out, and depending on what loan product you select, let's say if it's a VA cash out, that money's going to be yours. Same thing with conventional and so forth. So you can do what you want with it once that money's in hand. So if you want to go out, again, use that money to assist to purchase a secondary home or an investment you can to land, you can also do that as well. Um, 
also going in, in any other different type of investments um, that are out there. But those are those primary aspects that I see more people doing now than ever, really. And the cash out option has really been a very popular one, considering that equitable equity within your home is really this it's just exploded. So every time you turn around there, it's just become your home is becoming more and more valuable, which is also feeding into that mindset of the average buyer is they see that taking place. And when we thought that was going to stop, it hasn't, and it's been steady throughout. And I think that's really been what's been a driving factor of why you keep seeing more buyers come out to the market. You're not being so afraid of what those higher costs and price that are being asked of the seller. So like, how does that really work? Let's say the cash out option and the HELOC option. How does that really work? What are those things? So for your cash out, essentially what it is, is they're going to come out and evaluate your home. And they're going to give you what they call like an appraisal value for your property. Based off of that value, you'll be able to go through and effectively complete your loan at that said value amount. So for instance, if I have my home currently, and let's say I owe $400,000 on my home, but I've had it for several years and I want to take out a cash out refinance and I get it appraised and it comes back at 600,000. So I got $200,000 there of equity within my house. Depending on whatever loan product that you're using, they'll give you a percentage of how much of that money you can take out. I use VA because a lot of folks out here do that. You can go up to 100%, so that 200,000 is fair game. Now, with that cash out option, you're going to have to income qualify for that. So whatever you take out, essentially whatever you're making has to make up for it. You see how that works where you're taking that money out. I have my 200,000, but my loan amount will now be 600,000. So I need to qualify for that 600,000. Uh, for your HELOC, your HELOC will establish itself like a line of credit, much like a credit card. So the equity is there. It'll come out as revolving and it'll just sit there. You can use that money um, for whatever you want to do, whether it be a renovation, whether it's to pay off um, a vehicle or debts or things of that nature, but it does not go away like how cash would just be spent and it's no longer there. It sits there just like a revolving line of credit for what it is. And then you have at some point you need to repay that off, take it down to a zero balance to which you'll still see, which you'll still sit and be there. Or to close it out, you can take out another refinance, such as a cash out, to close it out essentially close to loot. But yeah, HELOCs are very popular in a sense that people can hold on to it for over as long as they want, really, and be able to utilize it for different reasons. Okay. So it's, uh, looking at those two concepts, you look at it, would you even look at that as a possible vehicle for investing? Or you just say, you know, just doing the math, just leave it alone and go find another way to finance your future investment endeavors. How do you look at it? I definitely look at it as a vehicle for investing. Um, HELOCs are several methods about going out and using that particular method to go and increase like your real estate portfolio. You're able to go out and get different investments. It just requires a disciplined mind. So once you're using it, it's just like a credit card. So as you spend on that, you have to be disciplined in terms of how you're using your debts and the money that you're making that way. Whatever you're spending, you're able to replenish or put back. So that's one popular method. People love to use that HELOC to, again, kind of set themselves straight and move themselves forward. Um, the same thing with cash out refinances. Again, that's not a line of credit, but at the same time, people are using that vehicle to, again, purchase investment properties or, you know what, maybe it's time for me to take out this equity within my home. I can rent out my current property and go buy a new primary residence someplace else. Um, that's something that I encounter a lot here as well. And many people can use that across the nation. I mean, right now it's probably being used or thought of more often because there's so much equity being added to the homes based off the current market. Okay. Well, I could, I, I could see that as a popular uh, move with things like that. Cause you know, you have a lot of people who are currently in their homes and they're saying, Hey, you know, I built up all this equity due to the rise of, you know, home values, things like that. Maybe they had it for a couple of years. They may be looking for some other ways to get inside of it. Now, um, people who are sitting back saying that they're anticipating a downturn, you know, in the economy. Um, what are some ways you will prepare, you know, from uh, let's say you're a homeowner or maybe you're a real estate investor. What are some ways you will prepare, 
your portfolio, your real estate portfolio or to prepare yourself for a potential downturn? Well, if you're going to be heading towards a downturn, like I said, uh, I believe cash is your friend. You have things set aside and you're preparing for any type of downward turn that could be disadvantaged to yourself. Um, one of the things that we always talk about, even when we're doing our seminars and we're talking with people before we become homeowners is, you know, you always have a plan or an exfil, as we would say, if you're in military terms. So that way you're not over-invested into something. And then when it doesn't turn out to be what you think it's going to project to be, you're not in over your head because nothing can make you feel like you're underwater or drowning worse and being in a home that's either too expensive or you're over-invested to where your money that you got coming in is just being siphoned out of you because you're trying to take care of multiple properties. So you have to, your ability to forecast and know that you need to have, again, a plan in case something goes wrong or have your money on hand to be able to get you through those rough times. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a quick break. And I mean a quick break. We're going to take a quick break. And I want you guys and girls to stay tuned as we come back more here live from Honolulu, Hawaii. Of course, well, I'm from Denver, Colorado, but we're coming live from Honolulu, Hawaii. I want you guys and girls to stay tuned. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm Rusty Komori, host of Beyond the Lines on Think Tech Hawaii. I was the head coach of the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we were fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. My show is based on my two books, Beyond the Lines and Beyond the Game, which is about leadership, success, character, and creating a superior culture of excellence. Please tune in and watch my show every Monday at 11 a.m. on Think Tech Hawaii and on YouTube. Aloha. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back here live from Honolulu, Hawaii. Well, Denver, Colorado via Honolulu, Hawaii. I don't know why I keep getting that mixed up, but pardon me tonight. It's been a long day. But if you have missed the beginning of this episode, I definitely uh, would tell you to go back and look at the beginning of it. We spoke about some of the things you can do with equity that's built up inside of your house, being from a cash payout or a HELOC, the current state of real estate, real estate versus REITs versus land versus single family homes. But ladies and gentlemen, we got more to get into. We're here live here with a uh, loan officer from Hawaii, Mr. Sean Sutton from Align Mortgage. We're glad to have you. How you doing today, sir? Doing fine. How you doing? All right. Now, you spoke about um, educating people there in Hawaii via workshops and uh, webinars. Can you tell us more about that from Align Mortgage? So certainly. Um, so what we do every month is we put on seminars that are free and online. So we encourage anyone who's either thinking about a home, investing in property to attend these seminars. And where they become um, very advantageous to the everyday buyer is that we cover everything from the actual product itself through interest rates, closing costs, loan process. That way uh, you have a fully educated buyer once you head out there. So we offer these every month and they're twice a month. We do the one that's twice a month is for VA Pacific. And then we also do one that covers FHA, USDA, um, conventional loan, and then also touches on the VA as well. So we try to keep it um, to where every point of, of any loan that you're trying to go out there and capture, you learn a little bit about it. Um, also, when it comes down to things like like specialties like like your HELOCs and things of that nature. Even though our company doesn't provide those, we still touch on those bases. And we also offer a live Q&A. So if you have those questions there, again, we're all loan experts with it. You ask, we fire away, you get an answer right then and there. Okay. So how can people sign up or figure out more? Do they just go to the website? Yes, they can. Our website is at www.alignedmortgage.com. Uh, once you enter that website, you'll see up top, it'll say seminars. You click on it, 
there's uh, different states that you can sign up through. Um, of course, with us being Hawaii, you select Hawaii, and it will give you the dates to which you can attend. And that's where you'll click and then sign yourself up. It's pretty laid out there and um, uh, self-explanatory from that standpoint. Okay. So we're here now on the website there. We just walked through the linemorgage.com to get more from webinars and things like that. Right. So now I want to ask you the next question as we go into um, the current state that we're talking about, when people say, hey, let's look at some different opportunities that are going on right now. Um, when you look at the world of refinancing, we just seen a recent dip in um, interest rates for houses. Am I correct on that? You're correct. So refinancing okay. is even though it's a better interest rate is it good to refinance how much money do you need how much is it going to cost tell us all about that refinance market for people who already currently own a home who want to take advantage of current interest rates especially for veterans i have no problem and i think when it comes down to re refinancing in this particular market ever since the pandemic started i think as we would call you you're chasing that rabbit in a sense where interest rates, they kept falling and they kept falling and people are watching this and you're receiving things in your mailbox telling you to refinance. The one thing you want to do is always speak to an individual like myself and find out if it's advantageous to do so. So just because something does exist doesn't mean it always comes with a good cost. So with that being said, for example, if I'm sitting at a 3.25 interest rate and I receive something in my mailbox saying that, hey, I could make your interest rate 1.75. Well, that sounds absolutely extraordinary. Who wouldn't want to jump at that? But sometimes you have to look about, okay, what are the costs? What are the fees associated with that? And that's the dangers that you come into once you're refinancing. It is a good thing to do is just make sure you're not adding too much to your loan. That way, all that hard work and money that you're putting into your home, you're just not simply adding more and more back on it, meaning you don't want to end up further back than where you started. Is it advantageous? Is the money that I'm saving every month equatable to the amount of money I spent to get the interest rate? Okay. So give me, for example, what would be a good price? Um, let's say currently me, myself, I have a 275, right? I get something in the mail that says, Prince, we're going to give you a 175. My house costs 436. Um, well, no, 445, I think it was. And it said, hey, you know, we're going to give you an interest rate of 175. What are some key indicators? You know, of course, I'm going to call you and say, hey, you know, hey, Sean, what do you, what do you think about this? Uh, what is a good uh, rate to take? And for veterans, what advantages or things that are out there that veterans could take advantage of? So for the veteran standpoint, the VA Earl, which is Interest Rate Reduction Refinance Loan, is a great loan to go out and conduct and complete really your refinance on it because it's no charge in a sense for you. There's no closing costs associated, associated with it that's due at signing. Well, you say, well, he said no closing costs. There's always closing costs with the loan. It's just with that particular one, it can be rolled into your loan amount. And with government loans and interest rates, they typically come, again, with low interest rates and good pricing, meaning that you're more likely going to receive a lender credit or have a very low buy down. And when that term buy down, you hear it a lot, people may not understand exactly what that is. It's where you have your closing costs with your loan, based off your loan amount, let's say, like you mentioned there, is 430. So you're probably looking about, let's say, 6,500 in closing costs, something along that line. Well, if there's a buy down cost that's 1,500, you're gonna add that 1,500 to that 65, 8,000 would be your closing costs. Because it's an EARL, it can then be placed within your total loan amount, thus being no cost. Okay. So that's how that would work. And that's one thing that's advantageous there for VA borrowers is that VA EARL. A lot of times, though, those lower interest rates, the, we use the example of 2.75. So if we're going at least a half a point lower, 2.25, especially early onset of this year, that particular interest rate would have probably came with $2,000 or $3,000 of rebate or lender credit from an entity like myself. That's what you're looking for. So to answer that question of like, hey, what money should I be looking for? Really zero. You want to make sure, it, one, it doesn't cost you anything to get the actual rate, and it's minimizing the amount of money being put back into your loan. But at the end of the day, if you're reevaluating like, hey, 
am I going to, how long am I going to keep this property? Most homeowners keep a property about eight years. Um, if I'm going to stay here, like for myself, I'm going to live in Hawaii for, you know, foreseeable future. And okay, I can take a little bit of a stretch and put a little extra money into that loan because I know for a good part of my 30 years, I'm going to stay right here. But if I'm just looking short term and three to five years, I'm just going to go back and say, hey, I'm going to potentially sell this home. And obviously, you want to watch how much cost that you're putting into your actual interest rate, um, how much uh, money, again, is being spent towards that loan. So that's the thing you want to watch out for. And then also my last point here, for those flyers that you get in the mail, you definitely want to make sure you're checking for little things. Um, they try to trick you a lot of times with like big numbers, large fonts that, that catch your eye because everyone looking at the, the, the sparkly thing in the sky, which would be the 1.75. So mm -hmm. a, a small date, sometimes it's indicated on those flyers, will tell you as of, meaning that with interest rates, you're gone. The day that rate or you receive that flyer, that interest rate at that pricing that they're promising, it's probably already passed. It changes every day as soon as the market opens and it closes. So that's one thing you have to be mindful of. And then with the uh, fees and costs, the little words at the bottom you have to make sure you're watching those things watch for those empty promises that they're putting in there and then you can always fact check them too as well hmm. okay that's a lot there to to look at now what do i have to do to a veteran have to do to qualify for the earl the the veteran refinance you know is there anybody that served somebody who kind of served what do we have to do to qualify well, for qualification, it'll be based on your eligibility. So you have a certificate of eligibility that you're receiving from the VA. And essentially what that is, is that's for any service member who has served for 90 days in a wartime, um, in a wartime time frame within the military or 181 days. This is for active duty personnel. Uh, if you flip over, if you're a guard or reserve, it'll go from... Um, the same 90 days you're called up on Title 10 orders, which is anyone called up on federal active duty orders. If you go and you get deployed from your National Guard unit or Reserve unit and you go to Afghanistan or Iraq or something along those lines, typically those are six or seven month deployments. Um, so as long as you're qualifying, you receive your certificate of eligibility. And that's something that any VA approved lender can do. They can go in the system, the VA portal, and open it up and you'll have that eligibility there. Um, you'll be able to have your, your VA Earl in place. Now, of course, to do the Earl, you have already had to make a VA purchase. Okay. Mm. That's how that will work out. If you are someone out there who already has a home with a conventional loan, but you are eligible for the VA, then I would recommend definitely, if you want to, to switch that out because the VA typically has lower fees and costs associated with it. Because sometimes there's people who bought many, many years ago, back when restrictions were a little bit tighter. It wasn't as always as open and as available as it is now. They've changed a lot in terms of how they service and treat veterans now. But back then, they used to have time limits on stuff. And the eligibility used to be stricter and things of that nature. But they've relaxed things as we've gone through the decades. So people who've owned homes for 20, 30 years, it's like, well, hey, I bought conventional back then because no one really told me about my VA loan. I didn't even know I was eligible for it. Well, now going back through it, if you know you're someone who served for that minimum time frame, those 90 days, or hey, I was in it for two, three, four, five years, I want to go and check on my eligibility status, do so, and then use that product to your advantage. Okay. All right. So pretty much active duty people, no, no luck. What's that? I said people that are active duty who's currently serving, no luck for them. They got to wait till they retire and are separate. They do not. So for those active duty personnel, because there's plenty of them out here who serve and they buy their home. So if you're in that scenario, you've already purchased a home and you're active duty. By the time you sign for your home, you're eligible to use your VA loan or your VA Earl, that is, at 210 days of seasoning and six payments. So about the seventh month, you're ready to go in terms of eligibility. The only thing they're going to require is that one, it being a net tangible benefit for you, meaning you're not adding so much to the loan to where it doesn't make sense. And the fact that it needs to be at least a half a point drop in your interest rate. All right. Well, Mr. Sutton, definitely um, 
glad for having you on. Definitely thank you for coming on. But for the people that want more from you or to hear more from you or to see more from you, where can they go? How can they find you? How can they follow you? Let us know. Well, I do have my handle there on uh, Instagram. So it's at um, Sean Sutton LO. You can follow me on Facebook. Sean Sutton, I have my MLS number, which is 146 201. It's my business page. Um, you can find me there and also on the website there at alignmortgage.com, www.alignmortgage.com. I'm under the Hawaii state. You'll see my smiling face there when you search for loan officers under Sean Sutton. Okay. Anything you want to leave the followers, listeners out there across the globe? I will leave you with this. Investor show. Great show. Love it. Keep tuning in. I'm so, so, so thankful that you're able to bring me on and be able to talk about this. I love helping people with their loans. I think what you do for everyone in terms of your financial, your financial advice and your business savvy is great. Keep up the good work. I appreciate you so much. All right. Thank you for being on. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. My name is Prince Dykes. This is the Prince of Investment. Until the next video podcast, cartoon, or whatever else crazy you see me do around the globe. Peace, be safe, I'm out, and thank you. Thank you.